he texted me and said, asked me if all my other clothes were dirty and I had to wear this. <laughs> so hopefully Adam will be back next week wearing maize and blue. So, <clears throat> Or he may not show up. You never know how long that grieving <laughs> period is, you know. So uh, this morning we're gonna we're gonna wrap up our series on biblical eldership, and uh, and again I wanna um, I wanna encourage us that um, this teaching <clears throat> this teaching does apply to all of us. And that's Adam texting me right now. <laughs> this teaching does apply to all of us, whether uh, whether you are a member here or not. This achie- this teaching applies to all of us because, as a body, uh, as a church, uh, the uh, the people that God places in leadership here, uh, it, it does. It affects it affects all of us, and um, <clears throat> and it's important to. Uh, to be aware of the things that that Scripture instructs us in, especially when it comes to our uh, our life and and faith uh, individually and and corporately <clears throat> as a body. So uh, it's important uh, for us to be aware of these things. And um, I want to draw attention uh, to. Hopefully, you grabbed a bulletin on your way in. If you didn't, there's some in the back, but there's an insert in the in your bulletin, and I want to. Uh, ask you um, there uh, on the on the one side of that insert there uh, there's a list of all the qualifications that we're going through and then the scripture references where those are found <clears throat> and then uh, on the other side um, I think there are some instructions there as if you are a, a, a member an official member here you've gone through the membership class uh, here at at Central Church. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to uh, to maybe write down some names of uh, of men that you feel would uh, would fulfill this role effectively and faithfully as uh, as elder uh, here at Central Church as a biblical <clears throat> elder. So, um, gives you the opportunity to uh, to uh, to be involved in the process and. Um, what we would ask you to do is that uh, if you are a member, if if there are, uh, if you would write some names down that uh, of people that you feel would fulfill that role, you can fold those up. You can put them either in the offering boxes in the back, or you can find uh, either Eric, uh, Rod, Steve, or myself, and uh, you can hand us those as well. Um, but uh, we'll make this available until the end of the year. I know people there may not be, uh, everybody may not be here today. Uh, if you're a member, you may be watching online or whatever, you can get one of these, uh, these pieces of paper and um, uh, give you a few weeks to, uh, to, to have uh, your input uh, there. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll make that available till the end of the year and then uh, the pastors will take those names, we'll pray for God's direction and then we'll, uh, we'll see where he leads. Um, so that's, uh, that's that insert. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that, uh, so after this week, we, uh, next week will be December and we'll be going into our, uh, what we've done over the last few years is take, uh, each of the elders and, um, give them a, a week to, uh, <clears throat> to give a message. Our word this year, we, we have three, uh, three Sundays that we'll be doing Sunday morning service. Uh, and so our word is ask. And so I believe Eric Eric is taking the A, Eric is A, Steve is S, and then, uh, and then uh, Rod is, is K there. And so uh, our word for December is ask, and <clears throat> they will each take a, a letter of that and uh, preach through those things, depending on what the, the theme is there that they, what, what their letter theme is anyways. So that'll start next week. And again, a reminder, uh, we'll be having uh, Christmas Eve service. And the very next day is Christmas, and uh, and so we won't be having a Sunday morning service. We will be uh, giving you the opportunity to be with family and kind of take that morning to, to be with family, and uh, and you can do church with your family. So you can join us on Christmas Eve. We'll do church together that day, and then 
uh, let you be with your families on Sunday morning. So, <clears throat> um, so let's pray, and we'll jump right into the uh, the final eleven qualifications that we find in Scripture for an elder, pastor, overseer, shepherd of God's people. Jesus, we uh, we come before you this morning, and we're just grateful. Um, we're, we've we've come out of Thanksgiving, and and uh, and again, the goal I think is that we would um, not. I think I know. Uh, the goal is that we would be grateful and express gratitude uh, all the time. And uh, so we want to do that this morning. <clears throat> We're grateful for so many things. We're grateful f- for the ability to be here. We're grateful for the fact that we have, uh, you've given us your word so that we can know you and you've, you've revealed yourself to us through the, through the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and we've been called sons and daughters and we've been adopted into your family and uh, and Jesus you came and uh, and you uh, were born as a baby and you lived a perfect life that we couldn't and uh, you died the death that we deserved <clears throat> and then you rose in victory and all of these things allow us to be uh, to be able to come into your presence with boldness and gratitude and thanksgiving and all of these things that uh, we are so undeserving of and so uh, we come this morning with grateful hearts, and uh, and we're grateful that we have the opportunity to uh, to learn and and uh, and and open up your word. And that is not the case in so many places in the world, uh, but we can openly come and <clears throat> open up your word and learn and grow and uh, and and move forward in your purposes together. So uh, we're grateful for these things and. It's in the name of Jesus that we are here and able to do that. And so it's in that name that we pray. Amen. Uh, So say to your, uh, say to somebody around you, nonviolent, not being violent. Say that. Say it. There we go. The overseer, uh, according to 1 Timothy 3 3, is, uh, is instructed to not be violent. That is also uh, a, a qualification that we find in First, uh, I'm sorry, Titus one seven. And Paul used uh, a, a variety of terms and words to describe the character of an elder in relationship, in relation to other people. Okay, there are some things that are that are kind of uh, internal things, in, internal descriptions, but there are also a lot of things that are described as. Uh, as as characteristics that this uh, this person must have in relationship to other people, to be nonviolent literally means uh, coming to blows. Okay, so fist fights. Okay, and can you imagine an elder meeting ending up with black eyes and bloody noses? And uh, uh, eh. <laughs> we've not gotten there yet, have we? <laughs> So, uh, so that's a good thing. But um, so, nonviolent, not a violent person, not having a tendency towards uh, extreme uh, extremes of anger, and uh, and resorting to uh, violence. Some cultures have more of a a tendency towards physical violence. Some of our Old Testament heroes. I'm sure you can you can look back in the Old Testament and we see violence used in in some. Uh, some ways in uh, with with some of our Old Testament heroes that had a problem with that. Even the disciples, even some of the disciples, had a leaning or a tendency towards uh, you know their their first response <laughs> being violence. You know, uh, two of the disciples were named the Sons of Thunder, and uh, James and John. And and uh, in in Luke nine fifty four, uh, they're they they're going out and. And they're walking through, and Jesus is with them, and they go through Samaria, and uh, and they're on their way to Jerusalem, and and uh, but these these towns, you know, some of them are like, no, 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 nope, we don't want anything to do with you, stay away. And James and John's first response is, Lord, do you want us to command fire down from heaven and consume them all? <laughs> Jesus is like, whoa, simmer down, <laughs> easy, bro. <laughs> <clears throat> their tendency toward violence. And you even see Peter uh, in the garden. 
And his first response, and again, you, you, we gotta, you got to know Peter's heart was, it, it, I can't say that it was always in the right place, because none of our hearts are always in the right place. But uh, his intention in that was to protect Jesus. That's a good thing. Uh, you know, he didn't really understand what was going on, that that stuff had to happen, even though Jesus told them multiple times. <laughs> But Jesus, uh, Peter pulls out his sword and he cuts off the ear. And, uh, and Jesus is like, oh, Peter, you're still not getting it. Like, you're still this. And, and it's so cool to see. If you, if you look at Peter's life, it's so cool to see when he, you know, these types of things in his life, this pattern of this in his life, and then, and then the way that God continues to work in Peter's life and, and, uh, and the things that he writes then as he's, as he's older and he's matured a little bit and um, the change in his life. But physical violence there. Uh, it's important to note that violence is, a ten- is the tendency of our flesh. And so when we give in to violence, when we give in to that, when that is a display in our lives, when that is a, a pattern in our lives, that's an indication that we're not walking in step with the Spirit, but we're, we're giving in to our fleshly inclinations. That's our flesh. That's a response of our flesh. The use of physical force to get our way. And this could include physical violence, but it also can include <coughs> violent language and threats. The way we use our words. And this takes the, <clears throat> this behavior takes the elder trait of being quarrelsome, which we're going to talk about next, to an extreme. So how do you, how do you know if someone is, vi- is a violent person? How, how can we gauge whether someone is a violent person or a nonviolent person? Sometimes we can observe those things in their life. But the first place that we generally see this is with his family. Paul said that a man, an elder, <clears throat> must keep his children, and we'll talk about this later too, must keep his children under control, and then he adds something there. <clears throat> with all dignity. First Timothy 3, 4 says, with all dignity. And now to be clear, this doesn't mean that there's a lack of punishment in the family. It doesn't mean that <clears throat> the man, the husband, the father doesn't discipline. There's not discipline there. There's not punishment for, conse- or, uh, for, for sin, but this should not be displayed in uncontrolled reactions or excessive punishment, which is abuse. An elder, uh, his relationship with his wife should also be taken into consideration. How does this elder treat his wife? How does he speak to her? He must never resort to the use of physical emotional, <clears throat> or ver- verbal abuse in any of his dealings with other people. But a lot of times we see that we are the most, generally we are the most real with our family, aren't we? We can put on a good front, we can put on uh, a show, we can, we can act in front of other people for a, for a, a period of time. But we're most comfortable and we are our truest self generally when we're with our family. And so the observation of an elder's family is important as well. Next one, not quarrelsome. Say not quarrelsome. 1 Timothy 3.3 again, the elder must be not quarrelsome. Again, can you imagine an elder meeting turning into fist fights. I think that Paul could imagine that. 
I think he could imagine that. I think he did imagine that. And that's why he gave the elder qualification of not being, uh, not, not being violent. And as we know, most fist fights don't start out of nothing, right? They don't start out of nothing. Generally, physical altercations, physical violence start with what? Words. There's an argument, there's a verbal disagreement, and then it escalates into something that then becomes physical. And while fights, physical fights might be rare, verbal disagreements are more common. Paul says that an elder must not be quarrelsome or argumentative. To be quarrelsome is this. To be quarrelsome is to have a tendency towards hostile, and listen to this word, unproductive debate. Hostile and unproductive debate with a desire to win the debate and avoid losing at all costs. Win the debate and avoid losing at all costs, where a person's ego replaces the desire for productive problem-solving and decision-making. Being right is more important than progress. Being right or not losing is more important than getting to a place where we can move forward together. Not quarrelsome is an important qualification for an elder because argumentative, being argumentative is a manifestation of the flesh. I want to be right. And so I have to be heard. And I have to win. It's all about me. <laughs> it's a manifestation of our flesh. And that only pro pro uh, produces division, dissension, separation, rather than unity. Decision-making most of the time requires the freedom to express opposing ideas in a way that is still then able to be a productive thing. And if we're just continuing to argue back and forth, that's not happening. And when debates get heated, most of the time it causes us to hold to our side of things even stronger and progress is not made in moving forward. We hold to our, our side of things, our views, instead of listening, learning, and being able to come to a decision that moves us forward. James three sixteen through 18 says this, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without pretense. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. Not quarrelsome or argumentative. The next one. Say, not a new convert. An elder, according to 1 Timothy 3.6, an overseer must not be a new convert or he might be conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. That's pretty intense, yeah? Not a new convert, meaning they are, they are not new in their faith. They're not new in their trust in Jesus. And there are, there, are, uh, there are some examples of this being the case in Scripture. But it was absolutely out of necessity because of a, a, a new church plant. And there, wasn't, there weren't those who were uh, in, in that area, in the church, in the, in the town. There weren't those who were, uh, were, were long established in the faith. And so there is an example of this, but, but Scripture is very clear that, that 
that, that this should not be the case whenever possible, okay? Uh, 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 an overseer must not be a new convert, and he gives, uh, he gives a very, uh, in 1 Timothy 3 here, he gives a very specific example of why this is important that it's not the case. And it's important for us to note that Paul's not, uh, he's not focused on uh, the physical age of a person, but the length of time the person has been a believer. This is important. Because a new believer is generally more vulnerable to the temptation of pride than one who is more mature. And pride in leadership is very destructive. We see that that is what caused the the enemy to fall. And that's the example, the devil, that's the example he gives here. That they would not fall into the same trap as the devil same sin that the devil fell into, which caused him to be cast out of the presence of the Lord, it was pride. He said, I want that position. I want the position of God. I deserve that. I'm going after that. Pride is very destructive. In leadership especially, and it, it's, dis, it's destructive and it, and it causes dysfunction in the church. Because of this, Scripture says that it would not be wise for us to put a new believer in a position like this, and we would do him a disservice as well. Talking specifically about the role of an elder. We would do that person a disservice in putting them in that position in a time where they are still growing and they're still learning they're still they're still forming their faith and 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 learning sound doctrine we would be unwise it would be unwise to expose him to the potential trap of the devil when he isn't ready to handle that that would not be wise as as a body as a church and it would be doing that person a disservice as well Time is needed, many times, to confirm one's confession of faith. Is this, is this real? Is this something that is genuine? To dem- and, and time is needed to demonstrate character. In Titus 1.16, there were troublemakers, it says. It says there were troublemakers within the body who, this, professed to know God. There seemed to be a profession of faith. There seemed to be a a genuine knowing of God. And it says this. Then it finishes, it says, but they denied him by their works. Their works, their actions, their living out of their faith didn't line up with the profession of knowing God. Time reveals this stuff. And so this is why it's important for us to to, to take time and to, it would, it's not wise, Scripture says, to, to put a new convert, a new believer in a position like this. Rushing an appointment of a new believer can overlook character, important character qualifications. It takes time for the fruits of sanctification to reveal themselves and be evident in a believer's life. Next one, above reproach. Say above reproach. 1 Timothy 3.2 and Titus 3.6 say an overseer therefore must be above reproach. And if you could summarize all of the characteristics, all of these qualifications in two words, you would say above reproach. 1 Timothy 3.2, in, in, in the, the scripture there, 1 Timothy 3.2, the word can be translated without stain. Without stain. And the word in Titus 3.6 can be translated as blameless. This qualification is an umbrella word that encompasses all the other qualifications and all of the other qualifications after Above reproach are examples of being above reproach. This term, uh, this this qualification kind of of grabs them all, all of them, and, and kind of huddles them all together and gives them a big hug. 
brings them, <laughs> brings them all together. It means that the elder's life does not, listen, does not open itself up to personal attack or criticism. Don't open ourselves up. Don't, don't, don't give the, the opportunity for attack or criticism. And while he's not perfect, he should be blameless. There's a difference. Meaning that any accusations or challenges to his integrity do not hold up. Do not hold ground. Hold water. There are both positive and negative examples of this in, in these lists. Negative, negative examples would be that things like uh, a man not being faithful to his spouse is not above reproach. That would disqualify him. There would be reproach in his life. That would disqualify He would not be above reproach. A man who is not respectable is not above reproach. Positive uh, uh, things there would be uh, an elder should be hospitable, a good manager of his family, etc. These are things that bring uh, a, a, an elder into that, that category of being above reproach. And so there are public and there are private as aspects of this qualification. Paul doesn't seem to be arguing for some kind of sinless person because we know that there is no such thing. I love, uh, is it uh, Thrive, I think, has the, the, their, their slogan is, no perfect people allowed. <laughs> I like that. If you are perfect, you don't belong here. <laughs> and if you think you're perfect, you're not perfect. <laughs> You're deceiving yourself and others. He's not arguing, Paul's not arguing for some kind of perfect or sinless perfection. He's saying that his character, the elder's character, whether visible or private, is that of integrity. Is that of integrity. Accusations don't stick. Say good reputation. The next one is a good reputation. First Timothy three seven. He must have a good reputation among outsiders, so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. And this is a reminder of us that that, uh, that that this there's a public aspect to eldership, and while it is important to look at internal qualifications. It's very important. It's also important to, to see this person out in, uh, in, in society, out in uh, everyday life, outside of their family, outside of this, this family, this body. They have a good reputation outside of the church. It says it must have a good reputation among outsiders. There's a public aspect to eldership. And so the Lord and his church are not only conserved with the, with the private aspects of a leader's life, they're also conserved, concerned with the visible perception of those around him, inside and outside the church. The visible perception of his actions because the name and the character of biblical Jesus and his body, the church, are at stake. We can probably all think of examples of leaders who have fallen very publicly into sin. And we can probably, you probably have had conversations, I know I have, with people who take those examples of those public moral failings as an excuse to avoid God, to avoid church, to avoid anything having to do with God, biblical Jesus, or the church. It's 
So that's why it's one of the reasons it's important for an elder <coughs> to have a good reputation, to be above reproach. <coughs> If an elder is good with the body of believers but is crooked or dishonest in his business dealings, if he is a poor neighbor or an embarrassing member of the family, then he is he does not have a good reputation which would disqualify him in this aspect. Both the inner life of a person and his behavior around believers and his reputation with non-believers make up this this character trait that an elder has to have because when we fall in the eyes of especially non-believers when we fail in the eyes of especially non-believers it has a greater impact it has a great impact on bringing disgrace not only to the church but also to the name of the Lord. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. As Christians, we all take this into consideration. We should all take this into consideration in, in our interactions, in our dealings, in the words that we speak, in the way that we treat other people. <clears throat> but especially as someone who is a, a leader, in the church. And Satan will jump over, uh, will jump all over any opportunity he can get to neutralize the power and the influence of the church, of an elder, and bring shame on the whole church. He's called the accuser of the brethren, and any chance he can get, any chance that we open ourselves up to, he will take that. Isn't it hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is one of the biggest things that, that we hear that people have an issue. One of the biggest criticisms the world has for the church, people who call themselves Christ followers, hypo hypo hypocrisy, hypocrites. Elder's character has to be proven both inside the church and in the world because the world is watching for failure, and so is Satan. Next one. Devout. This is not a word that we use very often anymore. Say the word devout. Devout. Titus 1.8, the overseer must be hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, devout, or holy. That could be translated as holy. Maybe your, your, uh, your Bible says holy. Devout or holy and self-controlled. To be devout means the elder uh, has to go beyond the position of holiness that is given to believers through God. And, uh, uh, by God through the righteousness of Jesus, okay? So we are made holy, this is what this is saying. We are made holy uh, by, by nothing that we have done. We are made holy because of the righteousness of, of, of Jesus. So in the presence of the Father, we're made holy by God because of the righteousness that we put on because of Jesus' death on the cross. Not our own righteousness, Okay, so that would be position. We, hold, we, we can stand in a position of holiness in general because of what Jesus did on the cross. Okay, so this is saying that, that, uh, that the elder has to go beyond that. There's more to it than that. Not only is it the position that we hold of holiness because of the righteousness of Jesus, it means that they also have to show the evidence of practice the practice of holiness in their lives. They're living this out in their actions, in their words, in their thoughts. Holiness, holy actions, not just in, in, our, in our position, but in our practice. And again, that should, be, that, should be the, that, that should be the case for all of us as believers. 
but especially as someone who's supposed to be living things out as an example to the body, as an example to the flock. Holiness. Not only does the elder have to be a child of God, but he also, his life has to reflect the characteristics of godly holiness. What does holiness mean in the life of an elder? It's, it, it means undefiled by sin. And again, I want to make clear, this is not calling for perfection because none of us stand up to that. Free from wickedness, pure and holy. That's what this means in the, the Strong's Concordance. Because the elder lives things out as an example. The Bible encourages the flock, the local church, to Hebrews 13, 7, imitate their church leader's way of life. <clears throat> and so if we, want to, uh, if we want to be an example of holiness, as Jesus was for all of us, and we imitate Jesus then we also have to live those things out in front of other people, be an example. The life of Christ imitated by an elder will be a good role model for others to imitate as well. Holiness, devout. Next one is respectable. Say respectable. 1 Timothy 3.2, if you notice that there's a lot of repetition in the verses here. Okay, there are kind of three primary places, and, and that's all on your, the list you have, but there are kind of three primary places where there, there are lists of qualifications. 1 Timothy 3, 2, an overseer therefore must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. The elder should be respectable. This can be translated also as dignified or decent. Okay, respectable, meaning dignified or decent. And the word is used in the Old Testament to describe the same word is used in the New Testament. I don't know if I said Old Testament. In the New Testament to describe women's clothing. To describe women's clothing. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.9 that a woman's clothing should be respectable, should be uh, should be uh, dignified or decent. And this is, this is where we get the idea of modesty. And again, I will say, not only for women. <laughs> this, this verse here specifically is talking about, uh, this specific thing that Paul is talking about here is talking about women's clothing in this specific situation. But that would apply to, uh, to men as well. Dignified, decent, respectable, modest. That's where we get this idea of modesty. It comes from Scripture. It's not us just being prudes. It's, it's here. Dignified, decent, respectable. And in a similar sense, an elder must be outwardly respectable. Dignified and decent, well put together. The elders should be well put together and well behaved. Now, does that mean that they have to wear the, the, the latest things and designer suits and, and everything? Most of the clothes I get are from secondhand stores, to be honest. <laughs> That's not what that means. But, it, but it, there, is a, there is an aspect of being dignified and, and respectable, decent in the outward display. To say it in a negative way, he shouldn't be sloppy or disheveled. I love that word. It's an underused word in our language. Disheveled. And this word is closely connected to the idea of self-control. You could say that being respectable is an outward evidence of being self-controlled, of being put together, held together. Self-control. He doesn't look or act in a way that's embarrassing to himself or others. Everything about the elder should be respectable in the eyes of not only those 
he shepherds inside the church again, but also outside, outside the church. Respectable. Say faithful to the word. This one is important. Say it. I interrupted you. Say it again. Faithful to the word. Faithful to the word. First Titus 1 9. Holding faithful to the message as taught, so that he will be able to both encourage with sound teaching and refute those who contradict it. A good shepherd, Psalm 23, a good shepherd leads his flock to the best pastures. A good shepherd leads his flock to good pastures, to green pastures, to the best pastures. He wants the best for his flock, right? So elders should provide the best spiritual food for the flock, providing God's word, the best food for the flock. Romans 4 talks about the word of God is life-giving. A good shepherd wants food that is life-giving to his flock. Hebrews 5 says, talks about solid food. 1 Peter 2 talks about spiritual milk. Proverbs 4 talks about health when describing the word of God. Proverbs 30 says it doesn't need anything added to it. No additives added. No additives included. It doesn't need anything. The word of God is sufficient to be life-giving. It's solid, spiritual milk. It's healthy, and it doesn't need anything added to it. The word of God. The elder is a shepherd of God's people, but he must first be himself firm in his understanding, in his convictions, uh, the word of God. He must not be unsure of what he believes. He must be grounded in the word of God. He must be grounded. He must hold fast to. He must be unshakable in his understanding, in his use of the word. He should do his best, 2 Timothy 2, 15. He should do his best to present himself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Elder must be able to give the whole counsel of God to believers of all maturity levels, Paul tells the Ephesian elders that he didn't hesitate to proclaim to the church the full counsel of God, the whole of Scripture, Acts 20 says. Starts with new believers, okay? New believers, and Scripture talks about this in, uh, in 1 Peter. New believers, just like a new baby, they're not able to handle uh, a steak. A baby is not able to handle eating a steak. Okay? Mmm, steak. My, my stomach just went brr. They're not able to handle the, uh, a, a steak, and so they need milk, right? A baby needs milk. The, the basics, the simplest, something that's easy, and so an elder has to be able to have an understanding of that to be able to uh, effectively communicate that to younger believers, to new believers, the full counsel of God. But also, that has to then continue and be able to communicate more solid, deeper theological uh, uh, ideas and, and thoughts, doctrinal things that are, are, are more than just basic to those who are more mature. A full, the full counsel of God. A shepherd and elder must rightly handle the word. First, applying it to himself and then to others. Again, avoiding hypocrisy. And that's what the, that's what the Pharisees did, right? They, they piled all these standards, all these, these things of holiness on to the people, but they themselves were not living those things. He says, don't do that. It's got to start with you. you the, the elder has to live that stuff out first, has to understand and, and, and apply those things first, and then he can communicate that 
and require that of others. Faithfully communicating God's word and also faithfully correcting error when there's deviation from God's word. We're getting close. Say, his children behave. Did you know that this was one of them? (laughs) Rick Crane is smiling and nodding his head. It's good to see you this morning, Rick. 1 Timothy 3, 4 says this, and this, is, this, this, this qualification is, uh, is, is listed in, in multiple of the, of the lists, multiple places. 1 Timothy 3, 4 says, He must manage his own household com- uh, competently and have his children under control. Again there, with all dignity, I will add that. And Titus 1 6 says, An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. When looking at and evaluating a man's uh, character, a man's care for his family, the condition of his children can be a key indicator. Can be. Say, not all the time can be. This means he parents and guides his children as a concerned, responsible father. He is not a harsh tyrant or a bully. Looking at a, a, a man's family. The elder, first and foremost, is a shepherd of his children in a respectable and dignified way, caring not only for their physical needs, but also their emotional and spiritual needs as well. He's not only a disciplinarian who gets obedience based on punishment, he lives out Ephesians 6, 4, which says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So again, it's not saying don't discipline your kids. <laughs> because other places in Scripture we see that the, uh, the Lord disciplines those he loves. So discipline is love. Ignoring bad behavior and just allowing it is one of the most unloving things you can do as a parent. Because we desire better for our kids. We desire godliness and holiness for our kids. And to just let them do whatever they want would be incredibly unloving. For God to just allow us to do whatever we want, these things that we want to do that are called sin and they cause damage and separation from the Father, For God to allow that would be incredibly unloving. And so his discipline is because he loves us. He disciplines the child that he loves. So it's not saying don't discipline. It says bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. The discipline and the instruction go together. They go hand in hand. And so when the discipline takes place, it it shouldn't be just a a, a harsh discipline when there's then the father walks away and the kid's going, what just happened here? (laughs) That's not the goal. The goal is the discipline and then the instruction. This is why discipline came. This is what happened. This is what I desire for you. This is why discipline is important because if you do this now, inside of the home, I had this conversation with one of my kids the other day. If I allow this, this home is like a training ground for your future. If I allow this now, it will only be exasperated and, and, and exaggerated in the future. If you speak like that to your sibling, you may be disciplined here. If you speak to to that like that at a, at, to, a, to a kid at a, at a college party, 
you get hit in the mouth. <laughs> you speak to that that way to a to a law enforcement officer. You don't get grounded for two days. You get thrown in jail. It's a training. It's a, it's a discipline. But there's also an instruction. The instruction of the Lord. He shepherds their heart in a loving relationship rather than just looking for external behaviors. Behavior modification is not the goal. Looking good in public is not the goal. Looking good when people are watching you is not the goal. Heart change, purity of heart, a heart that is desiring to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord even when no one is watching is the goal. So managing his household well is about an elder exercising his authority in a way that is dignified in his home. And the result of that is his household respects him and his leadership by being under control. Next one I just mentioned is uh, manages his household well. Say manages his household. Now say well. There you go. Not just manages his household, but manages his household well. First Timothy, that was loud. First Timothy 3, 4. He must manage his household uh, competently, have his children under control with dignity. The elder's ability to shepherd his own family well is key in managing God's family. This is an indicator. This is something that we can look at. If, a, if an elder has trouble managing the few people inside of his own household, he may not be able to manage the, the larger body, the larger family of God's household, of, of, the, of, the, of the flock he's been given. And a home is where a man manage, learns to take on bigger responsibilities many times. Getting married and having kids, gen, a lot of times, generally, will mature a person really, really fast, won't it? There's responsibilities that now not only affect me, but affect another person or multiple people. The church is not a business, though. The role of an elder is not boss or CEO. Elder should generally be more of a fatherly figure. That's why there are examples here of, of, of multiple examples of, uh, of, of, of qualifications that apply to the family at home. Children behaved, manages his household. The next one is going to be also an elder is a gentle father who protects and leads and cares for and feeds the sheep. The shepherd analogy is there. The shepherd analogy, and these are all things that a shepherd does with, with his flock, and that's what an elder should be to the body as well. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, elders have to do this. We all have to do this, but especially an elder. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ who existing in the form of God, did not consider uh, equality with God as something to be exploited. He emptied himself. He emptied himself. This is one of those things that I have been challenged with in my own family. And this, this family as well. I'm tired. I don't feel like it. <laughs> I've just done this, this, and this. I deserve a break. Pastor Dan is an, is a, an incredible example in this. As are Steve and Eric and Rod. I can get selfish. I deserve a break. <laughs> 
what's the what's the the uh, the statement or the the saying? Uh, you can rest when you're dead. <laughs> I don't necessarily fully agree with that, <laughs> but there is an aspect of that that is true. We have one life. <laughs> this life is short. This life is short. We can either spend our time in things that are not eternal and won't last and are in, in the view of eternity worthless or we can expend ourselves. We can, as this says, empty ourselves for things, investing in things that are eternal. And there are two things that I have come across in Scripture on this earth that will last forever, that will, that will extend into eternity. And those two things are God's Word and people. God's Word and people. So you want to invest in eternal things? For all of your time, empty yourself to those two things, God's word and people. Just like Jesus, an elder will not use his position of authority for his own benefit, but he will use it for the blessing and benefit of other people. How can I bless other people? How can I live? How can I empty myself? Set aside my own things and my own desires and I'm tired and I don't feel like it's <laughs> for the blessing of other people. Elder is, is someone who is a servant who lays down his life for the sheep just like Jesus did. And his home life will show what sort of shepherd he is. The way he treats his family, the way he prefers his family, the way he lays down his things for his family is, the way, is, a, is, a, is a good indication of how he's going to lead God's family, the church. Might be a successful businessman a leader in the community, but the real test for eldership is behind the closed doors of his home. <clears throat> How does he manage his home? The last one, I'm almost done. The last one, a one-woman man. Say a one-woman man. Again, this qualification is in both lists or two of the three lists. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.2 says, An overseer therefore must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And Titus 1.6 says, An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. He has to be a one-woman kind of man. An elder must be above reproach in this area, in his, his, the, the area of his sexual and marital life. He has to be blameless in his interactions with the opposite sex. His romantic and intimate affections is all focused on one person, his wife. He has to be a one-woman man. And in this time, in this culture of moral failings and moral decay, elders have to be proactive. In the, and, and again, we're, we're, we're speaking specifically about elders, but this goes for all of us. <laughs> we have to be careful in our interactions with the opposite sex. And it's not just being on the defensive. We will fail if we are simply on the defensive. We have to be proactive. We have to set standards. We call them many times roadblocks. These are the things I am not willing to do and I am not willing to compromise in this area regardless of what other people think. 
You've heard of the Billy Graham rule, probably. Refusing to be alone with someone of the opposite sex. The world laughs at that. That's not practical. That's not needed. And whatever. But there's wisdom in that, right? There's wisdom in that. <clears throat> we have to be proactive rather than on the defensive, rather than reactive in dealing with this important issue. <clears throat> Within the elders, within the group of elders, there should be openness in this. There should be sensitivity, accountability, and prayers. And I appreciate that about our group of elders that we have. There seems to be an openness in this area. We're constantly praying for our wives and our marriages in our meetings, in our prayer time. We're praying for our wives. We're praying that our marriages would be strong. There would be an example <clears throat> that would protect us in these areas. Even if an elder does not struggle in this area of immorality, we have to think and keep in mind how our interaction with the opposite sex is viewed by other people. Because rumors can start, right? Even with something innocent. Rumors can start. We have to be wise in what seems, could seem to, or should seem to be an innocent conversation and even in our greetings. I got in trouble with this in college. The way that I greeted the opposite sex. I am a physical touch person. I am a hugger. I love hugs. I love hugging people. It came across the wrong way. It presented itself in a in a way that was flirtatious and uh, and 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 was very um, leading on. It wasn't my intent, but that's the way it presented itself. I don't want that. My wife helped me see that <laughs> and changed it. And so the way I will hug is, is different now than what it was then. We have to think about these things because it presents itself in a way that may be innocent <clears throat> but can come across the wrong way. Compassion and kindness can be misunderstood for something more than what it is. We have to be aware of these things. This is just... This isn't like, oh, God's raining on my parade. I can't hug anybody I want in whatever way I want. Like, it's innocent, whatever. It's not raining on me. This is wisdom. This is wisdom. And I can set aside wisdom for my own selfish desires, my own desire to be right, or I can embrace, pun intended, <laughs> I can embrace wisdom. Because I'm called to something different. We're called to live differently. Ephesians 5.3 But sexual immorality and impurity or greed should, have not, should not even be heard of among you as, proper, as is proper for the saints. Not even a hint of it. Not even something that could be viewed as that. Avoid it. Scripture says in other places, run from it. Flee from it. You have the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife is all being like, bro, come on, let's do this. And he's like, uh-uh. And he goes and runs the other direction. Awkward situation. Not only for Joseph, but Potiphar's wife as well. He didn't want anything to do with it. And he ran the other direction. That's the idea when Scripture says flee from it, flee from youthful desires, flee from sexual immorality. That's the idea. Run from it. Have nothing to do with it. Even if your desires and everything are innocent, run from it. If there's even the hint of it, it shouldn't have, even the hint shouldn't be in this group of believers is what it's saying. Run from it, because we're called to something different. We're called to be different. (laughs) 
So that's it. There's 31 of them. We covered 31 of them in four weeks, and I apologize. These messages have been a little bit long, but these are the qualifications listed in Scripture for a biblical elder. And again, these are not to be taken lightly. And so we will not take them lightly. We will not take them lightly. The role of an elder is very important to the health of and vitality of the mission and of the church. And so again, our prayer here at Central Church is that we would all be people who are striving to exemplify and live these things out because they're godly characteristics. And that we would take this list and pray for men who live these things out, pray that God would raise them up to lead us as they are being led by Christ. Amen? Amen. So again, I will draw your attention to those uh, to those inserts. You can take that home and pray over it. But over the next uh, uh, until the end of the year, I'd like to have those things uh, by the end of the year. If you are a member here, you have the opportunity to be involved in that process in a, in a, in, a, in an aspect of that, and uh, we would uh, we would value that, and then. Uh, after the, after the new year, we will, uh, as elders, we'll pray through this stuff and we will um, we'll take those names and we'll make a decision as we feel like the Lord is, uh, as the, the Holy Spirit is leading. So we'd invite you to be involved in that if you are a member here at the church. Again, next week we'll start our, uh, our Christmas, our December series, Ask. And uh, so you'll want to you'll want to be here for those things. Reminder again: we'll, we're doing a, uh, a Christmas Eve service, and there will be not, we will not be having a service on Sunday morning, which is Christmas Day. We'll allow you to to be with your families. You can come be with us as a family on Christmas Eve and and celebrate that. And we'll do church then, and uh, and and then leave uh, leave you to do church with your own families on on Sunday morning, however you see fit. So, Father, we thank you so much for. Uh, the uh, the clarity in which you speak these things to us, the the uh, the importance that you put on um, this uh, this this position of shepherd, pastor, elder, the uh, the the leadership of your body, and uh, and and Father, we don't take that lightly. We we uh, we we um, uh, we appreciate the uh, uh, the. The fact that there is a uh, a greater standard, um, because there, as, as your word says, that there is a, a greater accountability, and uh, and and we thank you for first and foremost the leadership of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the church, as the head. It says the head of the body. We appreciate that. We value that. We honor that. We. We magnify that position that, that only Jesus holds. We appreciate the, the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit, and we value those things. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that as, uh, as we move into this time of, of, uh, of that we feel like you are leading us in, of expanding our team, we pray for your direction. We pray for your guidance. We pray that you would reveal men who would desire to serve and lead well. We need your help in these areas as, as, we, as we do daily, <laughs> but, uh, but we pray for your guidance and direction. I pray your blessing on these people who are in this room and who are watching online, your richest blessing in, uh, in whatever things that you're de- they're dealing with, they're going through, their, their, their daily lives outside of this room as they leave. Pray that your presence would be felt and known, and that would bring peace and comfort in all of their, in all of their daily uh, comings and goings. Thank you again, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Again, if you have any questions about anything, if you uh, about the process, about uh, anything that that we discussed, I would love to talk to you. I know that Steve and Eric and Rod. Uh, would love to talk to you. I know that Dan would love to talk to you. Uh, that that is uh, he he's a little bit laid up again, so uh, continue to pray for him. But uh, but he would love to talk to you as well as he always does. But uh, continue to pray for him and and that he'd be back with us 
very shortly. If you have any questions, if you have any, anything that we can pray for, please don't hesitate to, uh, to come at, up and uh, we'll take those things before the Lord. So God bless, stay dry, and have a fantastic Sunday.